Section 3 of Supernatural Horror in Literature by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Natter. Supernatural Horror in Literature by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Section 3. The Early Gothic Novel. The Shadow-Haunted Landscapes of Ossian the chaotic visions of William Blake, the grotesque witch dances in Burns' Tam O'Shanter, the sinister demonism of Coleridge's Cristobal and Ancient Mariner, the ghostly charm of James Hogg's Kilmeny, and the more restrained approaches to cosmic horror in Lamia and many of Keats' other poems, are typical British illustrations of the advent of the weird to formal literature. Our Teutonic cousins of the continent were equally receptive to the rising flood, and Burger's Wild Huntsman, and the even more famous Demon Bridegroom Ballad of Lenore, both imitated in English by Scott, whose respect for the supernatural was always great, are only a taste of the eerie wealth which German song had commenced to provide. Thomas Moore adapted from such sources the legend of the ghoulish statue bride, later used by Prosper Merime in the Venus of Ille, and traceable back to great antiquity which echoes so shiveringly in his ballad of the ring whilst goethe's deathless masterpiece faust crossing from mere balladry into the classic cosmic tragedy of the ages may be held as the ultimate height to which this german poetic impulse arose but it remained for a very sprightly and worldly englishman none other than horace walpole himself to give the growing impulse definite shape and become the actual founder of the literary horror story as a permanent form fond of medieval romance and mystery as a dilettante's diversion and with a quaintly imitated gothic castle as his abode at strawberry hill walpole in seventeen sixty four published the castle of otranto a tale of the supernatural which though thoroughly unconvincing and mediocre in itself was destined to exert an almost unparalleled influence on the literature of the weird first venturing it only as a translation by one william marshall gentleman from the Italian of a mythical Onufrio Muralto, the author later acknowledged his connection with the book, and took pleasure in its wide and instantaneous popularity, a popularity which extended to many editions, early dramatization, and wholesale imitation both in England and in Germany. The story, tedious, artificial, and melodramatic, is further impaired by brisk and prosaic style, whose urbane sprightliness nowhere permits the creation of a truly weird atmosphere. It tells of Manfred, an unscrupulous and usurping prince determined to found a line, who, after the mysterious sudden death of his only son Conrad, on the latter's bridal morn, attempts to put away his wife Hippolyta and wed the lady destined for the unfortunate youth, the lad, by the way, having been crushed by the preternatural fall of a gigantic helmet in the castle courtyard. Isabella, the widowed bride, flees from his design and encounters in subterranean crypts beneath the castle a noble young preserver, Theodore, who seems to be a peasant, yet strangely resembles the old lord Alfonso, who ruled the domain before Manfred's time. Shortly thereafter, supernatural phenomena assail the castle in diverse ways. Fragments of gigantic armor being discovered here and there, a portrait walking out of its frame, a thunderclap destroying the edifice, and a colossal armored spectre of Alfonso rising out of the rains to ascend through parting clouds to the bosom of St. Nicholas. Theodore, having wooed Manfred's daughter Matilda, and lost her to death, for she is slain by her father by mistake, is discovered to be the son of Alfonso, and rightful heir to the estate. He concludes the tale by wedding Isabella and preparing to live happily ever after, whilst Manfred, whose usurpation was the cause of his son's supernatural death, and his own supernatural harassings, retires to a monastery for penitence, his saddened wife seeking asylum in a neighboring convent. Such is the tale, flat, stilted, and altogether devoid of a true cosmic horror which makes weird literature. Yet such was the thirst of the age for those touches of strangeness and spectral antiquity which it reflects, that it was seriously received by the soundest readers and raised in spite of its intrinsic ineptness to a pedestal of lofty importance in literary history. What it did, above all else, was to create a novel type of scene, puppet characters and incidents, which, 
handled to better advantage by writers more naturally adapted to weird creation stimulated the growth of an imitative gothic school which in turn inspired the real weavers of cosmic terror the line of actual artists beginning with poe this novel dramatic paraphernalia consisted first of all of the gothic castle with its awesome antiquity vast distances and rambling deserted or ruined wings damp corridors unwholesome hidden catacombs and galaxy of ghosts and appalling legends as a nucleus of suspense and demoniac fright in addition it included a tyrannical and malevolent nobleman as villain the saintly long persecuted and generally insipid heroine who undergoes the major terrors and serves as a point of view and focus for the reader's sympathies the valorous and immaculate hero always of high birth but often in humble disguise the convention of high-sounding foreign names mostly italian for the characters and the infinite array of stage properties which includes strange lights damp trapdoors extinguished lamps moldy hidden manuscripts creaking hinges shaking arras and the like all this paraphernalia reappeared with amusing sameness yet sometimes with tremendous effect throughout the history of the gothic novel and is by no means extinct even today though subtler technique now forced it to assume a less naive and obvious form an harmonious milieu for a new school had been found and the writing world was not slow to grasp the opportunity german romance at once responded to the walpole influence and soon became a byword for the weird and ghastly in england one of the first imitators was the celebrated mrs barbot then miss akin who in seventeen seventy three published an unfinished fragment called sir bertrand in which the strings of genuine terror were truly touched with no clumsy hand a nobleman on a dark and lonely moor attracted by a tolling bell and distant light enters a strange and ancient turreted castle whose doors open and close and whose bluish will-o'-the-wisps lead up mysterious staircases toward dead hands and animated black statues a coffin with a dead lady whom sir bertrand kisses is finally reached and upon the kiss the scene dissolves to give place to a splendid apartment where the lady restored to life holds a banquet in honour of her rescuer walpole admired this tale though he accorded less respect to an even more prominent offspring of his otranto the old english baron by clara reeve published in seventeen seventy seven truly enough this tale lacks the real vibration to the note of outer darkness and mystery which distinguishes mrs barbot's fragment and though less crude than walpole's novel and more artistically economical of horror and its possession of only one spectral figure it is nevertheless too definitely insipid for greatness here again we have the virtuous heir to the castle disguised as a peasant and restored to his heritage through the ghost of his father and here again we have a case of wide popularity leading to many editions dramatization and ultimate translation into french miss reed wrote another weird novel unfortunately unpublished and lost the gothic novel was now settled as a literary form and instances multiply bewilderingly as the eighteenth century draws towards its close the recess written in seventeen eighty five by mrs sophia lee has the historic element revolving round the twin daughters of mary queen of scots and though devoid of the supernatural employs the walpole scenery and mechanism of great dexterity five years later and all existing lamps are paled by the rising of a fresh luminary order mrs anne radcliffe seventeen sixty four eighteen twenty three whose famous novels made terror and suspense a fashion and who set new and higher standards in the domain of macabre and fear inspiring atmosphere despite a provoking custom of destroying her own phantoms at the last through laboured mechanical explanations to the familiar gothic trappings of her predecessors mrs radcliffe added a genuine sense of the unearthly in scene in incident which closely approached genius every touch of setting and action contributing artistically to the impression of illimitable frightfulness which she wished to convey a few sinister details like a track of blood on castle stairs a groan from a distant vault or a weird song in a nocturnal forest can with her conjure up the most powerful images of imminent horror surpassing by far the extravagant and toilsome elaborations of others nor are these images in themselves any the less potent because they are explained away before the end of the novel 
Mrs. Radcliffe's visual imagination was very strong, and appears as much in her delightful landscape touches, always in broad, glamorously pictorial outline and never in close detail, as in her weird fantasies. Her prime weaknesses, aside from the habit of prosaic disillusionment, are a tendency toward erroneous geography and history, and a fatal predilection for bestrewing her novels with insipid little poems attributed to one or another of the characters. Mrs. Radcliffe wrote six novels, The Castle of Athlin and Dunbine, 1789, A Sicilian Romance, 1790, The Romance of the Forest, 1792, The Mysteries of Udolpho, 1794, The Italian, 1797, and Gaston de Blondeville, composed in 1802, but first published posthumously in 1826. Of these, Udolpho is by far the most famous, and may be taken as a type of the early Gothic tale at its best. It is the chronicle of Emily, a young Frenchwoman transplanted to an ancient and portentous castle in the Apennines through the death of her parent and the marriage of her aunt to the lord of the castle, the scheming nobleman Montagne. Mysterious sounds, opened doors, frightful legends, and a nameless horror in a niche behind a black veil all operate in quick succession to unnerve the heroine and her faithful attendant Annette. But finally, after the death of her aunt, she escapes with the aid of a fellow prisoner whom she has discovered. On the way home, she stops at a chateau filled with fresh horrors, the abandoned wing where the departed chatelain dwelt, and the bed of death with the black pall, but is finally restored to security and happiness with her lover Valancourt. After the clearing up of a secret which seemed for a time to involve her birth in mystery, clearly this is only familiar material reworked, but it is so well reworked that Udolpho will always be a classic. Mrs. Radcliffe's characters are puppets, but they are less markedly so than those of her forerunners, and in atmospheric creation she stands preeminent amongst those of her time. Of Mrs. Radcliffe's countless imitators, the American novelist Charles Brogdon Brown stands the closest in spirit and method. Like her, he injured his creations by natural explanations, but also like her, he had an uncanny atmospheric power which gives his horrors a frightful vitality as long as they remain unexplained. He differed from her in contemptuously discarding the external Gothic paraphernalia and properties and choosing modern American scenes for his mysteries. But this repudiation did not extend to the Gothic spirit and type of incident. Brown's novels involve some memorably frightful scenes and excel even Mrs. Radcliffe's in describing the operations of the perturbed mind. Edgar Hunley starts with a sleepwalker digging a grave, but is later impaired by touches of Godwinian didacticism. Ormond involves a member of a sinister secret brotherhood. That and Arthur Mervyn both describe the plague of yellow fever, which the author had witnessed in Philadelphia and New York. But Brown's most famous book is Wieland, or The Transformation, 1798, in which a Pennsylvania German, engulfed by a wave of religious fanaticism, hears voices and slays his wife and children as a sacrifice. His sister, Clara, who tells the story, narrowly escapes. The scene, laid at the woodland estate of Mittingen, on the Schuylkill's remote reaches, is drawn with extreme vividness, and the terrors of Clara, beset by spectral tones, gathering fears, and the sound of strange footsteps in the lonely house, are all shaped with truly artistic force. In the end, a lame ventriloquial explanation is offered, but the atmosphere is genuine while it lasts. Carwin, the malign ventriloquist, is a typical villain, of the Manfred or Montoni type. End of section 3